Good morning. Please bear with me. I've lost my uh, I lost my voice two days ago and still haven't found it today. I don't know where did it go. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I will not sing. I'll just let the singer sing. But uh, yeah, let's worship the Lord this morning by really having confidence. Okay. Of course, this is not what the world says. The world preaches that, you know, to believe in yourself, to be confident in who we are, in what we can do. Well, our confidence is not like that. Even in many places, actually, in, in the Bible, you will see this expression of confidence in the Lord. For example, in Romans chapter 8, it starts there, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? That's a confidence. No condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the key there is those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? In Christ. As it says there later on, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So, this is our confidence. Our confidence is not in ourselves, not in what we have done or what we are doing or what we can do. It's really all our full, the full weight of our confidence is in Christ Jesus indeed. In God, in sending His own Son indeed for our propitiation, He became sin who knew no sin. That's in Second Corinthians 5. So that we might become the righteousness of God. That's our confidence. And therefore, of course, every day we walk with confidence in Christ. Christ is such a precious possession of our lives. He is our everything. In Him, in Him and in Him alone, we are protected. We are purchased. We are safe. We are freed from the slavery of sin. We are given even all that we need in life and godliness and it's all in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we can, even today, as we sing, we can sing with confidence that the Lord hears us. Again, not because of us. It's because of Christ. He treats us like His own Son, Jesus. He sees us as His righteous Son. So again, this is our confidence as we approach even the holy presence of God we know that we are accepted in the Beloved. That's our confidence, brothers and sisters. So please rise. As we have this confidence, let's now just worship our Lord Jesus Christ. He is indeed our greatest possession, our treasure, the Lord Jesus, the fairest Lord Jesus Christ, who is our all in all.
sea, and set my poor soul free. He showed my need of the one who saves in my depravity. Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, who bled and died for me, and by faith I know. will only boast in you, O Christ, our crucified Savior, our risen Lord and King. Yes, Lord, our confidence is only in Christ. Because in Christ, we have been made righteous, Our sins have been blotted out. We have been adopted as your sons and daughters, O oh God. It's all because of Christ. So here we are, standing before your holy presence, not afraid anymore of your wrath, 
because there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. your name. All glory to you, O Lord. Even for our gathering this morning, our desire is only to honor your name. The focus of our minds and our hearts is only Christ. We only want to see Christ be magnified. We only want to know Christ more and more. We only want to hear Christ being preached to our hearts. So that we might indeed to relieve in Christ alone, for Christ alone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much that our confidence is indeed in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We'd like to ask the uh, children to stand uh, so we can dismiss you kids. All right. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you because we can sing about how you pardon us, those who have come to salvation in Jesus, our Savior. And Lord, we are praying the same for these children. Even as we dismiss them, dear Lord, we pray that 
your Holy Spirit will minister to them through the teachers and through the lessons prepared for them. We ask God that even at such a young age, you'll open their hearts because we know, dear Lord, that that is possible. We trust God that uh, even as they leave the, their Sunday school classes and throughout the day, you will bring their minds to even think about you and think about what they've learned. We pray, Lord, that you might be exalted and glorified through the work of the Sunday school teachers. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Kids, you may go off now. Hello again. <laughs> Welcome to my talk show. Uh, last Sunday was a struggle physically. Uh, my neck was acting up again. And so I decided that maybe today I'll sit down and, uh, and hopefully the Lord's message will not be compromised by my sitting down. Let's pray for our study of God's Word. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your Word, your Word that gives us light, your Word that is infallible, without error, and your Word that is given to us for all eternity because, Lord, as you said, nothing can destroy your Word. And we trust, dear God, that even as we study your word this morning, you will speak to us. You will allow us, Lord, to not just be hearers, but doers of your word as well. We give you back all glory in Christ's name. Let me open with a question. Do you think that the Apostle Paul was ever married? You think he was married? Well, some think that he was at one time married because of his statement in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. He said, Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? This verse does not explicitly say that Paul was married. However, people still hold on to that belief. Others conclude that he was married, but that his wife must have passed away since he never mentions her in any of his epistles. And then there are those who hold to the belief that Paul was married because historically it was required that a member of the Sanhedrin be married. But even if this was the case, Paul never said that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He might have come close to becoming one, but it would seem that he never advanced that far in the Jewish religious ladder before his conversion. On the other hand, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, he was clearly not attached, especially because of what he said in 1 Corinthians Verse, uh, chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. He said, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. He also declared that he had the gift of celibacy based on First Corinthians chapter 7, also uh, 1 to 7. You will not read that now where he taught on marriage and then says, Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. So Paul's marital status is actually a matter of speculation. We do not have definite proof from Scripture to know the answer. But whether Paul was married or not, he certainly has set a great model for parents. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul wrote, My children, with whom I am again in labor, until Christ is formed in you. Obviously, the Apostle Paul was not writing to his biological children here, 
he was referring to his spiritual children, the men and women who had come to faith because of Paul's ministry. In this verse, we note that the chief or supreme objective of Paul for his spiritual children is that they be conformed to the image of Christ. And this must be the goal and aspiration of every parent for his child. Understand this. The goal for raising your children is not for them to be successful in their careers when they grow up. Your goal in raising your children is for you not to vicariously live out the dreams you have never reached yourself. Your goal in raising your, your children is not even to make him realize whatever cherished dream or ambition he has embraced for his life. No, sir, that is not your goal. Rather, your goal as parents is to make him look like the Lord Jesus himself. I open with this point today because as we continue in our pulpit series in Matthew's Gospel, after some weeks off, we come upon this matter regarding children. So please open your Bibles with me. Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. Now before we tackle this passage, let's retrace our steps in Matthew 19. Remember the Lord Jesus is traveling towards Jerusalem where he will be arrested, tried, crucified, and after three days resurrected from the grave. Chapter 19 tells us that the Lord Jesus is not there yet. He is in the area of Perea, where again he started ministering to the needy. In that place, he was healing and teaching the people when a group of Pharisees questioned him about his position in regard to divorce, which was a burning issue at that in, in that society at that time. But their question to the Lord about this matter did not come from pure motives. In verse 3, we are told some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him. Naturally, the Lord answered these Pharisees. First, he explained that uh, he explained God's original design with respect to marriage. Verses 5 and 6. According to Jesus, marriage is between a male and female leaving their families and uniting together as one flesh. And then he explained in verses 8 and 9 that divorce does not reflect God's plan for marriage, but the hardness of the human heart. Contrary to the position held by most Jews, the Lord taught that divorce is not a God-ordained option. It is evidence of the hardness and sinfulness of the human heart. The Lord then clarified that there is an exception when it came to God's teaching about divorce. In verse 9, the Lord said, except for immorality. Why is immorality or adultery an exception? Because it is the one sin that destroys the one flesh concept. But after hearing the Lord's teaching on marriage and divorce, the disciples felt that God's standard for marriage and divorce seemed to be too strict. Like many, they thought that the marriage is defiled, is the marriage as defined by God is impossible. Thus, they concluded that the single life would be preferable than being bound to a wife. The Lord, however, does not try to defend his teaching on marriage here, nor does he try to extol marriage over singleness. Instead, the Lord thought about singleness in verses 11 to 12. The Lord declared, marriage and singleness are good. They are both gifts from God. Thus, the Lord explained that singleness or celibacy is good for some, for the ones who is able to accept it or to whom it has been given, as he says in verse 11. 
the Lord then underscored that his teaching about singleness is premised on the perspective that the kingdom of God is the highest priority in a believer's life. In other words, the work of the gospel comes first and everything else second. Therefore, for the Lord, it is perfectly normal for some Christians to give up marriage for the kingdom. We have tackled all of this in our past three lessons. So if you were not with us then, you can just access the recording on YouTube. Anyway, this is the context that leads to our passage today. Now, some folks might think that this episode in, uh, in our text today has no major significance. In fact, many commentaries do not offer much space to explain this episode. But this incident cannot be dismissed as some cute slice-of-life episode intended to merely warm our hearts about Jesus' love for children. We will realize that the episode is weightier or more weighty than it seems when we discover that it is not only Matthew who reports about it. Mark and Luke took the time to record this episode as well. The Apostle Mark even added details that we do not see in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. Now, I think it is fitting that the Lord's teaching about marriage should be followed by this episode regarding children, especially since children are typically the fruit of the one flesh principle that the Lord Jesus just taught about. The report regarding this episode is straightforward. As the Lord just wrapped up his teaching on marriage, divorce, and singleness, the Lord's time with the disciples was interrupted with when some parents brought their ch little children to Jesus, asking him to bless their children, to pray for them, and even take them in his arms. This was not uncommon in that culture. In Scripture, we see laying on of hands was used for a variety of a variety of reasons it was used to for ordaining leaders as we read in numbers 27 deuteronomy 34 even acts chapter 6 it was used for presenting sacrifices exodus 29 leviticus 1 it was used for healing matthew 19 i'm sorry matthew 9 mark chapter 6 it was used for giving the holy spirit acts chapter 8 in Acts chapter 19. And it was also used for parental blessing. Genesis chapter 48, and, uh, verses 7, 14 to 18. So in our text, we learn that the parents approach the Lord so that they may lay his hands on them and pray. The children were not brought to him for healing, but for blessing. And when the parents did this, Religious leaders laid hands on children who uh, religious leaders who usually laid hands on children to bless them, not only to bless them, but to be greatly used of God. So we can be certain that this was also what Jesus did, that they might also be used of God for his kingdom. But our text reports that when the parents brought their children to Jesus, the disciples almost immediately reacted and rebuked the parents. We see that in verse 13. Matthew's version simply said that the disciples rebuked them. But in the Gospel of Mark, the apostle used the imperfect tense indicating the continuing nature of the rebuking. Mark, in fact, used a very strong word. And the substantive form of the word has been used for punishment. So, the disciples were really letting the parents of these children have it. They were just too hot under the collar to, towards these parents for bringing their children to Jesus. Why did the disciples act this way? Well, I think it was probably because they were annoyed that the parents interrupted an important discussion. Or perhaps they thought that these people were delaying their journey to Jerusalem. Or maybe because the disciples thought that Jesus was too important to be bothered with dealing with children. 
Perhaps they thought that the Lord Jesus was too great a person. You know, the Messiah of Israel, who carried too great a mission and message to be bothered with such mundane matters as laying hands on children. I like how Chuck Swindles put it. He said, and I quote, By the rules of this world, the more wealthy, famous, important, and powerful you are, the less approachable, accessible, and available. None of us can stroll into the White House, knock on the door of the President of the United States, and ask for a few minutes of time to talk. If we were to see an Academy Award-winning actress dining at a pricey Hollywood restaurant, who of us would be able to slip into an empty chair, an empty seat at the table, and ask about her next project? In other words, inaccessibility is a measure of importance. Not so with Jesus. As usual, he defied cultural expectations and turned the rule of the world upside down. He didn't favor the powerful, give access to the elite, or make extra space for the influential. He was imminently approachable, accessible, and available to everyone. Jesus was in touch with every kind of person, young and old, poor and rich, sick and healthy, corrupt and honest, harsh and courteous, hateful and loving, humble and proud, the devoted follower and the critic. The refusal to construct social barriers and to limit access is nothing short of astonishing. End of quote. Whatever the reason behind the disciples' action, the Lord said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So again, the Lord explains that the members of his kingdom belongs to such as these, referring to the children. Now, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, recall that earlier in Matthew 18, the disciples asked the Lord, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To answer this question, the Lord brought a child in their midst. And then, he, used, uh, he said in verse 5 of Matthew 18, and, whatever, and whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. In other words, the one who is great in the kingdom is humble. And then, when we come to Matthew 19, the Lord points to the example of the child once again. So in two succeed, succeeding chapters, the Lord used the image of the child to stress who the members of his kingdom are. Those who are humble like a little child. Now to get a good picture of what was happening here, we need to understand that the word used to refer to these children refers to suckling, nursing babes. The account of Mark even says that the Lord Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them. So these are not 12-year-olds or 10-year-olds. So they may very well be infants and maybe toddlers and maybe a little older than toddlers. Now we need to bear in mind that the laws of Moses taught that the, uh, taught the Jews to cherish their children. But for some reason, as we have seen in our past lessons, the children were looked down upon as negligible members of society. The Lord therefore points out that a child mirrors humility in the sense that a child does not have power, rank, position, influence, or authority. In fact, a child is subject to the authority of his or her elders. But there is more. The image of the child perfectly mirrors the person who is closest to the kingdom because of the child's simplicity, openness, honesty, and wonder in his attitude and actions. A child has no pretense, no agenda, no inhibition, 
no reluctance, no self-consciousness. To be sure, the Lord is not saying that all children automatically enter the kingdom, but that the kingdom belongs not to the proud, but to those who are humble like a child. The kingdom belongs to those who are spiritually, spiritually weak and bankrupt. It belongs to those who realize that they do not have the means nor the right to even com commend themselves to God. The kingdom does not belong to those who hold the attitude of the Pharisee. Remember him? The Pharisee who compared himself to the tax collector and, uh, and stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. We read that in Luke chapter 18. The kingdom of God rather belongs to those who pray like the tax collector who was standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Do we have this kind of humility? Do we have the humility like that of a child? How do we appear before God? Standing like the Pharisee, feeling entitled? Or standing some distance away, bearing one's, beating one's breast in brokenness like the tax collector? Do we feel entitled to the grace of God? Do we feel entitled to the blessings of God? Do we feel that we have the right to complain when things in our lives do not go as we want them to? Do we have a deep understanding that we desire to be, that, that we deserve to be condemned, to be left unforgiven? Childlike humility is what God expects from His disciples. He calls us to recognize our spiritual bankruptcy and humble ourselves. I will come back to this a little later on towards the end. But I'd like you to understand that humility and realizing our spiritual bankruptcy is not a one-shot deal. I mean, we are not merely aware of our spiritual bankruptcy when we are coming to saving faith in Jesus. The truth is, the way we enter the kingdom is the way we grow in the kingdom. When we came to, to God, poor in spirit, we do not shed off as we, we do not shed that off as we walk as his disciples. As his disciples, we should be continually be poor in spirit. And for this reason, we never grow tired of singing and rejoicing in the fact that we are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, and by Christ alone. Now, some people might be getting the impression that childlike humility means assuming the posture of doormats. So, we try to walk slowly and carefully, never causing our voices in excitement, and never raising our voices in excitement, never expressing any point of view that may be controversial, and most important, we lace our sentences with spiritual talk at every opportunity. That's what many people think. But this is not the kind of childlike humility God calls for. Childlike humility is focusing our attention and our energy, not in ourselves, but in Him who deserves affirmation. Instead of magnificent me, childlike humility compels us to praise and serve our marvelous Maker and Savior. And this is what the Lord taught Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 24, a very uh, familiar verse, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, 
Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Now some people might say, you, you mean God wants us to boast? Exactly. That's what he says. You boast, but you don't boast about magnificent me. You boast about God. You boast about the fact that you know God. It's very much like, if I may illustrate, the French movie entitled My Father's Glory. The film is is set between 1900 and World War I. It is about a school teacher who, and his wife living in Paris who take a vacation in the countryside of Proven, province in southern France. They bring along their two boys and the boy's aunt and uncle. The film shows that Marcel, the, the older son, deeply admires his dad. And he is embarrassed that his uncle dominates and intimidates his father. Early one morning, the two men go hunting. Marcel begs to go with them. And although his father seems to be weakening, his uncle firmly says that this is not something for a boy to be doing. As the men leave, Marcel sneaks off and follows them from a distance. As the men walk through the valley, chatting and looking for quail, Marcel walks along the ridge, hiding behind bushes when he thinks they might see him. By accident, Marcel flushes two royal partridges out of the bush. As the birds fly away, Marcel fa Marcel's father spots them and raises his rifle, as does his uncle. But Marcel's father is faster and fires twice. Both birds come plummeting to the ground at Marcel's feet. His uncle, however, thought that his father missed the birds. Marcel watches as his uncle reprimands his father. At this point, Marcel decides to show himself. He grabs the birds and lifts them high, one in each hand, and he, sh shout, and he shouts ecstatically, he killed them, both of them. He did it. As the camera zooms away from the boy, the amazing beauty of the hills and valley envelopes him as he stands, arms lifted with quail in hand, raising his, father, his father's glory to the sky. Four believers... By the way, that's not a Christian movie. In fact, the father there is an atheist. And that's, that's kind of like the debate that he and his uncle are, are engaged in. Anyway, for believers who have been humbled by God's grace and mercy, like Marcel in that movie, we are no longer consumed with ourselves. And as we behold the marvel of God's works and His wisdom, we are stirred by the greatness of God and find our hearts boasting that He is our Father and we are His children. Like that boy Marcel, we are enthralled by our Father's glory. Thus, even if difficulties come to our lives, even in the dark providences of life, and our prayers remain unanswered, we accept from the hand of God the storms and trials and disappointments that hit us. And through all of that, we still worship and praise Him for His unsurpassed glory. That is what humility does to us. The coming of the parents with their children in our text today did not only give occasion for the Lord to instruct them about childlike humility, it also allowed him to express his desire to pass on his great work to the next generation. 
This was something that God already displayed uh, in the Old Testament. Remember, just before the people of Israel entered the Promised Land, God instructed Moses to say to the nation in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. So God's program has already included the ministry of one generation to the next through the children, as we see there in Deuteronomy 6. And we glean some spiritual implications and applications about this priority from, you know, from our text. And I must say that these are not prescriptive points based on our text. I'm not going to expose it at this point. I'm shifting to a topical uh, matter, topical form of teaching for parenting. Okay, But I'm just going to use the episode as illustration. And so let me raise these points about parenting. First, by the illustration and example of our text, we are reminded to prioritize bringing our children to the Lord. Verse 13. The parents in our text understood their responsibility to their kids. They must have understood that they were responsible for the direction that their children went. Otherwise, why bother with taking them to see Jesus at all? Why bother fighting through the crowd just, allow, just to be in front of Jesus to submit their children to Him. Now, obviously, when I say we are to bring our children to the Lord, I am not talking about doing this literally, but spiritually. Neither am I talking about the parents bringing their children to be dedicated by their pastor, which is something that we do, and which is okay, but not necessarily uh, indicative of the salvation of the child. Friends, if God has given you the immense privilege of caring for children, whether they are your own natural children or are adopted, you have the spiritual responsibility to bring them to the Lord Jesus. That's your responsibility. As a parent, I have always lived with the overwhelming desire to bring my children to the Lord and see them coming to saving faith and growing to be like the Savior. I want nothing more than that. I do not think I will be able to live with joy as a parent if I do not see my children in Christ Jesus. For this reason, I take seriously Paul's words. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he said, Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I also adhere to the wise maxim. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I take these two passages very seriously. Now this verse, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, is not a divine promise, alright? God is not promising that when your child is old because you give them the proper training that you should, that he will not depart from it. This is not a divine promise. In fact, the whole book of Proverbs is not a collection of divine promises that will come to pass when we obey and the conditions of the promise. Proverbs, including the Proverbs 22 verse 6, are maxims meaning they wisely describe in a general sense the way that God has made the world to operate. So in the book of Proverbs, there are no promises that state that God will always 
and in every case, save our children. No matter how diligent we are in our parenting responsibilities and duties. All right? This is not a guarantee. However, generally speaking, children from Christian families that give heed to the instruction of the scriptures usually turn out much better than children raised in unbelieving homes that do not honor God nor His Word. Author J. Oswald Sanders reported that the father of the great American preacher, Jonathan Edwards, was actually a minister. And his mother, the mother of Jonathan Edwards, was the daughter of a clergyman. Among their descendants were, take this, 14 presidents of colleges, more than 100 college professors, more than 100 lawyers, 30 judges, 6 physicians, more than 100 clergymen, missionaries and theology professors, and about 60 authors. There is scarcely any great American industry that has not had one of his family among its chief promoters. Such is the product of one American Christian family reared under the most favorable conditions. The contrast is presented in the Duke's family, which could not, uh, which could not be made to study and would not work and is said to have cost the, the state of New York a million dollars. Their entire record is one of pauperism and crime, insanity and imbecility. Among their 1,200 known descendants, 310 were professional paupers, 440 were physically wrecked by their own wickedness. 60 were habitual thieves. 130 were convicted criminals. 55 were victims of impur impurity, of impurity. Only 20 learned a trade. And 10 of these who learned it in prison. And this notorious family produced seven murderers. Parents, pause and think and ask yourself, what character traits are you passing down to your children? Are you actively involved in bringing your children to the Lord, knowing them and guiding them to spiritual maturity? Or are you passively allowing their evil bent to run its course. Don't make a mistake about it. Your children have evil bents. You have got to recognize that evil bent. And by the way, it's not like a cookie cutter. You know, the evil bent of the eldest is the evil bent of the next and the youngest. No. They're different. And that makes it challenging to even identify and deal with the evil bents of your children. So you don't like to work too much, don't have too many children. Don't have 12 children because you'll have 12 evil bents to figure out and design a method for bringing them to, to Christ. Now, the Bible establishes clearly that parents are responsible to train their children according to God's instructions. And when we bring our children to the Lord, this would include at least three general responsibilities. First responsibility, we are responsible for evangelizing our children. Of course, the Lord Jesus was not saving these babies right there and then. He was merely praying for a blessing upon them. But the act of the parents in bringing the children to the Lord revealed that they cared about the spiritual condition of their children. Several parts of the scriptures tell parents that they are responsible to train, in, and, uh, uh, to train their children according to God's principles. 
And the hope is that God will work through our training and draw the children to Himself. For example, we are told in Proverbs 23, verses 13 to 14, Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with a rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. The Lord teaches that we are to train our children by not holding back discipline. Parents, do not hold back discipline. <laughs> All right? Do not ever hold back discipline. Introduce them to the rod. If possible, with spikes and rusted nails. No, I'm just kidding. Just the rod. And by doing so, by not holding back discipline, by using the rod, we might be the very instruments to bring them to the, to the saving truth of the gospel. And to rescue them from destruction and protect them from the foolishness that resides in their hearts. That's what we're hoping for. We must realize that sometimes the milieu of spanking becomes a tremendous opportunity to impress upon an unregenerate child his need for Christ's forgiveness as well as his inability to consistently obey God's commands in the Bible. So parents, you must do everything in your power that your children become acquainted with the gospel. And yes, during those times of discipline, that's even a great opportunity to talk about the gospel, to talk about his depravity. Samuel Worcester, missionary and Bible translator, had some very good advice to parents. He said, Children should be taught early the important truths of God's Word. They should early be taught that there is a God, that He is a being of infinite power and wisdom, knowledge and goodness, justice, mercy and truth, one God in three persons, that He is to be loved with all the heart and obeyed in all things with the most dutiful respect that His law is holy, just, and good. That all mankind are by nature sinners and are exposed to everlasting destruction. That God has freely given His own Son to die for sinners and to bring in everlasting righteousness for their justification. That everyone ought immediately to repent and embrace the Savior. That all the unconverted reject the mercy of God and will continue to reject reject it to their eternal ruin and that all who are thus renewed and made alive to God will be pardoned and sanctified and finally receive to, uh, receive to honor, glory, and immortality. This and other gospel truths connect with, uh, connected with this should be taught to our children with diligence and faithfulness. They are truths which concern their eternal salvation. Nor are we to say that children cannot understand them, for it has been found by pleasing experience that if proper means are used, children will very early get so much knowledge of divine truth as to be the greatest benefit to them in all their future lives. Parents, teach them early. Teach them that there is God to whom every soul will reckon in the last day. Earlier, coming here, uh, we, uh, we were listening. The, the radio was on in the car and it was on, I think, I didn't catch the beginning, but I think that was the was probably White Horse uh, broadcast and and they were talking about, the people were talking about, uh, apparently to this uh, Easter episode, the Lord's resurrection. And as they were talking about that, I caught an, a, a part of that and I emphasized that to, to my family. I said, you know, 
that is exactly what I mean by that is one point between the connection. If you will remember, the children were asked, they came to me for goodies, they were asked that question. What is the connection between uh, Easter, the Lord's Resurrection, and eschatology? And I'd like to congratulate you. Your children answered perfectly. <laughs> they each gave different points. So, so I hope that you can all explain the connection between the Lord's Resurrection and eschatology. Anyway, in that broadcast, I pointed out one thing. I said, that's another point between Easter and eschatology. Because he said in the broadcast, God is risen and we will reckon before him one day. If you're an atheist, you better, you better hope that Jesus Christ is not risen. Because he is risen, he will judge. Because he promised that he will judge. And that means he will be true to his word. And if you're not a believer, you will be judged. If your children never come to faith, just think about it. When they grow up, when the time comes, they will face God, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead to judge both the living and the dead. So, evangelize your children. Now, in bringing our children to the Lord, we are not only responsible to, for evangelizing them, but also in educating them. When the parents in our text, brought their little ones to the Lord Jesus. They were modeling faith in Christ. They were showing that the Lord was worth knowing. Let's look into the King James Version of the Ephesians 6 verse 4, the second part. It says, from the King James, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word admonition or instruction refers to the whole training and education of a child, including discipline. As the parents of your children, their lives must be, a, must be a blackboard on which you teach the truth about God. And this, my friend, is unending. This was emphasized in Deuteronomy 6, which we read earlier. So, teach your children all the time, while sitting, while walking, while playing with them, while dining as a family, while watching something on television, while marveling at God's handiwork in nature. Teach them until they develop right convictions and standards for living, until they've developed a right understanding of the person of God and what He requires of them. If I may share, when, um, when our children were young, I would allow them to play in the garage, share, the shared garage area in an apartment. One day, one of my daughters, who was probably three at that time, saw oil slick on the garage floor. And she explained, rather excitedly, look, Papa, the rainbow fell to the ground. Now, she was referring to the rainbow-like colors that appeared on the oil slick because of the light. I immediately saw an opportunity to talk about the covenant of God and Noah after the flood and how God put his bow in the sky in Genesis 9 as a sign of that covenant. That little incident was a blackboard moment which I used to teach her about God. And by the way, that was like throughout their growing up years. Uh, they'll watch something, uh, especially during summer, We'll watch something which I'd be watching with them, we would be watching with them, or I'd seen it before, so I know it's safe. And I'll tell them, okay, when they were able, ready to do it, okay, give me a reflection paper on that. <laughs> I did. That's not, I'm not kidding. They, they had to give me a reflection paper. And that would make, give me an opportunity to understand where they are in terms of understanding God, the Bible, or what I've been teaching them, and it gives them an, an opportunity also to process things in their minds, to, you know, to, be, to develop a critical mind. Kaya puro critics yung mga anak ko eh. <laughs> Sa lahat ng ginawa ko, puro, eh, mali! <laughs> you know, just, well, it, it helps them, it helps them get the wheels turning, expressing themselves. So when I, 
And I'd read it and say, what do you mean by this? Well, I meant is that you should have said it here. So it helps them get the wheels turning. It helps me understand what's in the heart. It helps me understand how I can approach them. So all their lives was like I was. It was like a blackboard moment. Uh, and 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 I would date my kids. I, uh, I would uh, you know rotate, pick them up in school, or or let's go out. Just everybody, no, just you and me. Let's go out. And so they they'll be like, okay, what what will he ask today? <laughs> so. Yeah. But understand this, with respect to the things of God, learning is not facts to be learned, but rather truth to be lived. It's not educating them to acquire knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but rather it is knowledge for the sake of practicing it uh, in their lives. Remember in Luke 11, verse 28, the second part, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God, and observe it. In other words, doctrine is to be turned into life principles and practice. We educate our children not because we want them to be filled with biblical data, but so that they can live in a manner that would please and glorify the Father. That's your goal. Now thirdly, bringing our children to the Lord not only involves evangelizing and educating them, but also encouraging them. By the parents' example of approaching the Lord Jesus, they were encouraging them to approach Him as well. I mean, one day, these kids will grow up. And what will they... They'll probably remember that time when their parents brought them to this man who must have struck them with an immense love that they could never forget. We therefore ought to teach and encourage them to go to God in prayer. And it would not be a bad idea to teach them to pray at an early age. Now, Paul instructed in Ephesians 6 verse 4 that parents are to nurture their children. The word nurture in the King James Version has the idea of encouragement. Parents are to encourage their children to know God. They are to help their children understand that the Christian life is about a relationship with an awesome God, an awesome and living and true God. And not a religion with a list of do's and don'ts. And the best encouragement for the children to know God is for the parents to display authentic spirituality. Take note of Paul's reference with regards to Timothy's heritage. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, grandmother Lois, and mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. The Greek term for sincere is anupokritos, uh, which means unhypocritical. So, there's nothing phony here. It's real, lived out faith. You see, Paul knew that the sincere faith modeled by Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois had impacted Timothy. That's the way authentic spirituality works. I mean, Christian teachers, books, churches, and schools can give the children, give your children the facts. But all that information cannot encourage them to know God unless God's truth is translated at home. Now, second, Applying the example of the parents in our text, aside from bringing them to the Lord, we are to earnestly seek the Lord's blessing upon our children. Seek God's blessing upon them. The parents in this episode must have realized that they needed help beyond themselves. They needed someone to pray. They needed someone to guide. They needed blessing on their children. They realized that the help they needed was spiritual help. That is why they sought blessing and prayer from Jesus. These parents understood that their children were not perfect. They were, in fact, sinful beings in need of divine help. Friends, never forget that children are not as good as they, you think they are. They're not. They may look cute when they're asleep, 
but only when they're asleep. <laughs> and you, when they're awake, you'd want them to go back to sleep, go back to sleep. Ask our Sunday school teachers. They need spiritual help that only the Lord Jesus can provide. Regeneration is the greatest need of our children. And it is also our greatest concern as parents. And the truth is parents are not capable of guaranteeing their children's conversion. We have no means of obtaining salvation on our children's behalf. However, aside from bringing our children to the Lord, evangelizing, educating, and encouraging them, we can also seek our Lord's blessing to rest upon them. So the question is, are we pray for, praying for the Lord's blessing upon our children? Commenting on this episode in Matthew 19, J.C. Ryle said, and I quote, Let us draw from this verses encouragement to attempt great things in the religious instruction of our children. Let us begin from their very earliest years to deal with them as having souls to be lost or saved and let us strive to bring them to Christ. Let us make them acquainted with the Bible as soon as they can understand anything. Let us pray with them and pray for them and teach them to pray for themselves. The seed sown in infancy is often found after many days. End of quote. Now third, the disciples by the disciples' examples and by application, by illustration, we should not allow ourselves to be the hindrance in drawing them to Christ. As you pointed out earlier, the disciples' action in preventing the parents from approaching the Lord with their children was incomprehensible. Apparently, they had not learned uh, what the Lord did in uh, the previous chapter, and they aggressively attempted to hinder them. Well, by way of application, we can sometimes act that way too. We can be the hindrance or obstacle to them being drawn to Christ. And there are many ways that parents do this. But let me underscore here two of them. Inconsistent training and inconsistent character. The truth is sometimes we are negligent and capricious in training our children about the things of God. As believers, we know that we should expose them to the church. Bring them to Sunday school and preaching. Involve them in church activities activities like the Youth Fellowship and VBS. We should also establish family prayer time. But we should not be inconsistent with fulfilling these things. We should do this with much earnestness, in systematic fashion, and with regularity. This should also not be carried out as a dull form an unpleasant drudgery. Rather, it should be a matter of deep and delightful interest. The kids must see that in you. You don't say today, okay, you'll go to the youth fellowship today, and then the next Saturday, you know, I'm kind of tired. Let's just spend the time in front of the TV. Let's just play games. You have to be consistent. And when you do it, when you bring them to the youth fellowship, they must see in you that this is your delight to expose them to God and His Word and to His church. Unfortunately, there are parents who would bring their children to church or youth fellowship as part of their kids' religious training. But times, other times, and for flimsy and capricious reasons, they will just call this off and therefore destroy the training they've started with their kids. Dear parents, Training and educating our children about the things of God should be consistent. And the heart of the parent should be entirely and visibly engaged. And when I say consistent education, it should extend to everything that is likely to aid in the formation of your children's character. The school, even the school they enroll in. Their entertainment or hobbies the books they read, and even the friends they have. Remember, 
one ill-chosen friend of your children's may undo all the good you are doing at home. I know your parents will balk when you say, you know, I don't think you should hang around with these people. And then the, your child would look up to you and say, what, are you a prejudice now? You know, they, they adopt the woke mindset and think that, you're a prejudice, mom. Well, you should be able to say no when you have to say no. A wrong friend may undo all the good that you're doing at home. That is why, from their very infancy, encourage them to look up to you as the selectors of their friends. Impress them with this necessity and form in them the habit of being accountable to you and consulting you at all times. Form that habit. Now, another way that we become obstacles to our children drawing to the Lord is by an inconsistent character. Parents, as you wish your instruction and admonition to be successful, you need to enforce them by the power of a holy example. Let me repeat that. As you would wish your instruction and admonition to be successful, you need to enforce them by the power of a holy example. Don't just be a sincere Christian, but a consistent one. Your children will know when you're being hypocritical or when you're letting your own life slide. Bear in mind that we cannot communicate to our children that which we do not possess. Only when God's words is in our hearts will we be able to convey it with passion, sincerity, and authenticity. Finally, this story in our text illustrates the heart of the Lord Jesus. As we said earlier, the disciples may have thought that the Lord was too busy or too important to bother with children. We know that the Lord was on His way to Jerusalem. And to be sure, the issue of the cross was more pressing in His mind. Nevertheless, the Lord stopped in His progress to the cross and paused to give them time to, give time to, these, little, to these little ones. The Lord felt a tender affection for children. And He demonstrated here His love and care for them. And then He says in verse 14, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to Me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The, par the parallel account in Luke 18 verse 17 adds, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. The Lord was talking about the dependency, the weakness, the simplicity, the openness and honesty, the lack of pretension and dependency that casts a person in utter humility on the strong and open arms of our Savior. Children are trusting, humble and dependent. These qualities are the requirements for a person to come to the Lord Jesus for salvation. A mother took her children to a diner for breakfast one morning. The diner was crowded and they had to take separate seats at the counter. The mother's eight-year-old daughter was seated at the far end of the counter and her, when her food was served, she called down to her mother in a loud voice, Mother, don't people say grace in this place? A hush came over the entire diner. And before the mother could figure out what to say, the man behind the counter said, Yes, we do, sister. You say it. All the people at the counter bowed their heads. The girl bowed her head too. And in a clear voice said, God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. The simple, unvarnished faith of that child, the child's example, shows those who would truly be saved. Kingdom citizenship belongs to, who come, to those who come to the Lord Jesus like children. Acknowledging 
that they have no means nor resources to be saved. This is such a wonderful passage, so simple to understand and so essential to apply. But an example of, our, of the parents here, we should be reminded that parenting is a stewardship. It is a privilege and a wonderful gift from God. Parenting, obviously, is not a walk in the park. It is a weighty responsibility. But a child is living proof of God's grace, not a mere burden or inconvenience which the world is trying to promote now with the, all the things that they're saying about the right of the woman to have her child aborted. And the Lord shows us here that we should take care of these little ones who are helpless, especially those who are our own children. God loved all believers when we were helpless in our sin, and we need to love the children who are helpless and dependent on us. And this certainly applies also to the children in the womb who are the most helpless and dependent children of all. But this passage also teaches that we must become like children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So let me ask you, are you a child of God? Have you humbled yourself before Him? Have you acknowledged your need and dependence on Him for all things, especially for the salvation of your soul? Have you confessed your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus who died on the cross to be your Savior? The Lord loves little children and He also loves those who become like little children by putting their trust in Him. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you for this wonderful example in the gospel showing us Lord your heart and showing us also the way to salvation and thus Lord for anyone who would humble himself and repent of his sins you welcome them into your kingdom with open arms because of the finished work of Jesus Christ and Calvary but this passage also reminds us parents of this immense privilege and immense responsibility to care for our children. I pray, dear God, for every parent here, Lord, especially the parents who have children who have not yet come to saving faith at whatever age they may be right now. I pray, dear God, that in your grace and mercy, reach down, O Lord, to these children Reach down, dear Lord, and touch their hearts so that they, their hearts might receive Jesus. So that their, their hearts might realize that by themselves they cannot obey your commands. They cannot be right with you and they cannot live right. And so I pray, dear God, that you might do this, Lord. Use the, you know, the parents, Lord. Guide them. Help them, Lord, to be able to assess their children rightly, deal with their sinful bends, and show them the Savior, not just by instruction, but also by their holy examples at home. Lord, I pray that you will bless every family represented here. I pray, dear God, that one day we will see each family here, knowing, Lord, that your grace has visited them, and many of the children, if not all of the children here, have come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.